So this is a fantasy Viking helmet that I did. This was, for me, a real fun piece to do. And I um, put up a picture of it online and got very little reaction to it. And uh, I, I looked online for uh, a group of leather workers who I could kind of share with. And I found one. Um, and what they were, some of the people there were making leather masks. And I had actually made a couple of masks way back when, um, but never done anything with them. And so I, at this point, thought, well, let me try making a leather mask. So the first one I made was the, uh, this bulldog. It was kind of complicated, but I had fun with it, and I posted a picture of it, and I immediately got a huge response to it. People were loving it. So I thought, well, great, I'll make more masks then. And uh, that turned into um, kind of an ongoing mask business that we're still doing today. And uh, uh, when I say we, I mean my wife and me. And um, we, I discovered also through this leather forum, I discovered the uh, website Etsy, which is an online marketplace for handcrafted goods. And uh, I thought, well, maybe I could sell some of my masks here. So I signed up and got a shop there. And um, started making masks and we make basically two kind of masks. They're, this is like a fashion mask. So this uh, really takes advantage of using the laser because it cuts out all these little parts which would be really hard to do with an X-Acto knife. And then the other kind of mask that we make are character masks such as this rabbit which has been very popular. So I had been making masks for about two years um, when I decided to make a Plague Doctor mask. I'd gotten several, several requests from people, and I thought, yeah, that could be fun. You know, it appeals to me. So I went online to do some research because I wanted to make it uh, as historically accurate as I practically could. And what I found was two different um, in contemporary engravings, one from the 17th century, it's by Paulus Fürst, who's a German. He did it in about 1565. And it shows the doctor in his full outfit with a hat and the beaked mask and carrying the staff. And then the second one is by Jean-Jacques Manger. Uh, and that was done in the 18th century, 1721. And um, little, some variations, but still the same beaked mask. So uh, looking at these, I thought, um, I really preferred the first one because it had the beak actually kind of flowing out, whereas the Manger one just sort of looked like it was stuck on there. And uh, that didn't appeal to me so much. I came across a photograph of a Plague Doctor mannequin in the Steno Museum in uh, Denmark. And it, he was dressed in the, the full garb and the mask he was wearing made out of leather, looked very much like the Paulist Fierce engraving, and so I used that as a reference. Now the main difference uh, was that both the engraving and the uh, piece in the museum had the eyes set really off to the sides or it wouldn't be practical, I don't think, to look out of them. So I did slide the eyes forward, but other than that, I kept it pretty much how I felt it would have been made. So this is all hand-stitched, many seams here, uh, except riveted where the strap goes on. And uh, it's got an um, adjustable belt and um, buckle and a strap over the top. And the eyes I made out of uh, clear acrylic, and I could uh, laser holes into them so I could then stitch them into place there. And this is, the, this is what we call our classic because it's the traditional, it's the first one we made. And this mask we do offer in three different colors. We have the tan brown there. We have an antique black here, which is designed to look old. So it has, uh, it's not a pure black, it has brown incorporated into it. And um, 
then we have our white here. And the lens colors that we offer are the gray, which you can see here, and the red on the white one here, a little hard to see, and the clear. So the uh, historical costume includes the beaked mask, a wide-brimmed hat, which symbolized, it was a doctor's symbol that they wore, um, a long cloak, gloves, um, some kind of boot, and then a staff. And the, they didn't really understand um, where plague came from because they didn't understand about germs at that point. But they did believe that it came from the air and they had this uh, miasma theory that said that air that smelled bad was bad air and it was likely to make you sick. And so, correctly to a large degree, rotting bodies or sewage or trash thrown out in the street is going to smell bad and it is likely to make you sick. They used this mask with the beak uh, and it allowed them to stuff in sweet smelling things like roses, carnations, herbs, spices, mint, camphor. And because the air smelled good, they thought that they were safe from getting the plague. The costume in its entirety was designed to cover every bit of skin so that none of this bad air could touch you. And the, um, the beak, besides having a, a place to hold the sweet smelling herbs, it also gave a very scary look which helped keep sick people away from you. It was very intimidating to see this uh, doctor coming into your house. And um, there was another component to it, which is that there was some belief that birds carried uh, and spread the plague. The kind of leather that we use for our mask is vegetable tan leather. And this is the kind of leather that's been made for hundreds of years, and it would certainly have been the kind of leather they used back then. Today, most leather is made out of chromium salts or other mineral salts which makes a fine leather. Uh, it's much cheaper to make because it's a much faster process. With the vegetable tan leather, you actually had to, you dig a pit in the ground and you'd put in oak bark and you'd put your leather, and you'd stack your hides in there and you'd let it soak for a week and then you'd move it to a, another pit with a stronger bath of tannin in it. And this would just take weeks to do. But it made a very fine leather as well. Now the big difference between the two and that one that matters to us is that the vegetable tan leather will absorb water readily. And when it absorbs the water and then you let it dry out part way, it becomes very plastic. And you can shape it, you can compress it, you can stretch it, and you can get it to these form to, to uh, adapt to forms that you couldn't do with the um, chrome tan leather. So we had a great response to this mask and uh, people loved it and one thing that we got inquiries about was, can you make it less expensive? Well, it's got a lot of work in it. It's got all this hand stitching. And it just takes a long time to sit down and do all that hand work. And I thought about it, and I, and I thought, well, if I could make one that didn't have all that hand stitching in it, um, that would be less expensive. And so I came up with the Cronkite. It's essentially the identical mask. It's just one's hand stitched and one is riveted. One other difference between them, and that is the paint job. So the original one is all hand brushed on, stained, and then hand wiped off.
And there it is. The Cronkite, what we did was we airbrushed it on. So it's just a paint that's airbrushed on. And that, so those two things, the riveting instead of the stitching and the airbrushing instead of the hand brushing allowed us to make the Cronkite for less money. The Cronkite, like the Classic, is offered in three different colors. We have your, uh, the tan, and we have black, and we have white. And again, the, they normally come, the black has gray lenses, uh, the white has the red lenses. The tan comes with black lenses, or gray lenses, I should say. Um, but when you, you can have them any way you want. You can mix the colors any way you want. So I continue to think about a way to make a less expensive Plague Doctor mask because people still said, can you make one less expensive, even though we'd done the Cronkite. And uh, I thought, well, one thing that still has the hand stitching in it or is around the eyes because I didn't feel like I could rivet those and have them lay out smoothly. It just it didn't flow properly. And another thing is that if you wear glasses, this does not fit over glasses. So I thought, if I could simply remove all that and just do a beak, perhaps I'd have another product. So I came up with this guy, the Pestis. And it's really the same mask, just with the top part removed. You can wear the Pestis just as a beak mask. Or, if you want to be a plague doctor, then you put on a balaclava such as this, which you can purchase through Amazon for under $10. Put on your beak. You get a pair of nice goggles, shooting goggles, welding goggles, fit them over it. And it's looking pretty good. All that's missing is the hat. And there you go. And we make the pestis, besides the black color, we also make it in a white. And it comes with an adjustable elastic band and a little neoprene nose pad, so it's comfortable. I was thinking about perhaps the Cronkite would look nice if it just had a slightly longer beak. So I came up with the Schnabel. And it's uh, essentially the same, just with the beak pulled out a few inches longer. The uh, Schnabel comes in two colors, black with gray lenses and white with red lenses. And a few months later, I came up with the Maximus. Now this uh, accomplished a couple things. Number one, it's a bigger mask and so um, it just fits a bigger face. And number two, I brought it out away from the eyes so that those who wear prescription eyeglasses can now have a mask to fit them. Um, in order to do that, I had to bring the lens further out away from the face, and therefore um, I made the lens bigger so that you could see out it just as easily as you could with the other ones. I also uh, went back to the hand brushed on staining in order to give it that richer, old-fashioned look. And you can see how easy it is to put on here. Even when you wear glasses. The Maximus comes in the same three colors as the classic. The antique black with the gray lenses. The brownish tan with the clear lenses and the white with the red lenses. So steampunk is an art movement that uh, in its basic form is 19th century science fiction. So if you think of Jules Verne and 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea or H.G. Wells and The Time Machine, had those novels been written today, they would have been considered steampunk. It began as a literary genre in the 1980s, but then moved out into other things, cosplay in particular, with its costumes and its props, which is kind of where I enter into it. 
and you'll find steampunks uh, modifying objects such as computers and bicycles and things and making them look as if they were 19th century, but in a science fiction sort of way. Steampunk not only strives to reproduce the Victorian aesthetic, but also to use the materials appropriate. So that would be leather, brass, hardwoods. The name steampunk applies to a time when steam was king, steam engines. Uh, before uh, electric lights, before internal combustion engine, before mass production, before plastics. One part of the steampunk world is a post-apocalypse dystopia. <laughs> and this kind of fits what I, how I fit into it. If you think of Charles Dickens' industrialized London with its darkness, its squalor, the children working 14 hours a day in factories, uh, air pollution, and you take that to an extreme in the steampunk world, then it becomes a world where no one can step outside his or her door without wearing a gas mask. And so that's where I kind of got into it. I um, was at a yard sale and I found a World War II gas mask and made out of rubber and such. Um, and I thought if I could take that same design and make it in leather, that would be steampunk. So this is what I came up with. So it's all leather, hand stitched. I threw in some interesting seams just because. It's got two different eyepieces, one of them telescoping. And um, then this is the, what you breathe through. And it's just a lot of sort of fantastical looking stuff. Uh, adjustable straps. So I was making this sort of thing before I got into the Plague Doctor mask. While I was making that first classical Plague Doctor mask, I was thinking to myself, I could make a really nice steampunk version of this by putting on the eyes and maybe the tip of the beak. And so I came up with a couple of designs. Came up with Dr. Boylan Pest and Ichabod. And the first one I came up with was Dr. Boylan Pest. And um, basically just that, two different eyepieces, um, the beak of the bird, and fancy rivets and again it's all hand stitched with kind of interesting lines um, and the idea here is that if you if the plague had come back and swept through any any place say Victorian England they would have come up with something like this uh, reflecting on the history of the plague doctor mask and just modernizing it a bit to fit the time but I thought you know I would like to see even a longer, sleeker beak. And I studied this a bit because I couldn't see how to do it initially because the bottom of the beak is right under the chin and the top is on the forehead and of course the eyes have to line up. That's how I came up with the design for Ichabod. So Ichabod actually is longer and narrower. And the way I do it is that the bottom doesn't go under the chin. It just goes to about where the mouth is. And then I have this lambskin throat cover that hides your mouth and chin. And I also, the other difference between the two, um, I made the beak larger and I put more surface decoration on it. And the, the process here, these pieces, the silver colored pieces are cold cast aluminum. And what that is, is a a mixture of resin and ground up aluminum powder. And when you put those together, it makes a, uh, it gets all the detail, but it doesn't require you melting aluminum and having that high heat. So it can be done cold. So it's called cold cast. And when that first comes out of the mold, it's just a very plain gray color and doesn't look like much at all. But when you start sanding it, and you get increasingly finer and finer and end up with 4 aught steel wool, it starts to shine. You, you're cutting through the resin and revealing the aluminum underneath. And then you, you finish that with a, um, by compounding it with a, a little uh, buffer, and um, that really brings the shine out. So I took this um, 
sort of floral design based loosely on something that might have been Victorian, but then sort of modernizing it a bit. And I applied it also to the fronts of the eyepieces, the sides of the eyepieces. And even the eyepieces themselves, you can see here, the eyepieces themselves are taller on the outside of the eye than on the inside so that they face more forward and it makes it easier to look out of. The Ichabod comes in two colors. Also, besides the black, it also comes in a white. Some of the accessories you may want to consider to go with your mask are the balaclava. This is available at Amazon for under $10. A Plague Doctor's hat. This one's based on the Paulus Furst engraving. And it has a um, chin strap on it. It's extra large so that you can have both the balaclava and the mask there. And it is designed to sit on the top of your head. And the chin strap will help keep it in place. And then also in the first engraving is the staff. This is the winged hourglass, uh, Tempest Fugit, which means time flies. It was used to symbolize death. You can still see it on headstones. And basically it's the hourglass, which before clocks was how you tell, told time, with wings, so it's flying away. And this staff was used by the plague doctors to direct people uh, where to go to uh, poke at the patient and see what was going on with them and keep people away from you that you didn't want near you. And here's what it looks like with the whole assembly. The mask goes on over the balaclava and then the hat. You could also uh, put this together with the white mask. This is another possible uh, costume idea with the, the leather hood. This one is based on the Manger engraving. And in this case, it's with the uh, Maximus mask and got little fasteners here that hooks it together.